Normally, to send RF signals, you would have radio chips or microcontrollers with radios in them, or maybe get creative with your electrical engineering degree. But really, anytime there's a change in electrical potential along a conductor, an RF field is made. It can be as simple as turning a light switch on or off. This is a CH32V203. It's a 35 cent microcontroller without a radio of any kind, but by noodling one of its pins around at a couple of megahertz just right, it's sending LoRaWAN messages to this commercial LoRa gateway at 904.5 megahertz, and that gateway is forwarding those packets onto the Things network where they can be accessed from around the world. And it can do all of this from over 400 feet away. I've worked on unusual RF projects with microcontrollers before, but none like this. It's one kind of ridiculous to get protocols running on microcontrollers that have no business running them. It's another altogether when the results are orders of magnitude more ridiculous than what any of the engineers I talked to about this imagined. 400 feet just barely scratches the surface of some of the insane tests that we're going to show later on. As a general disclaimer, I wanted to point out that most of the power that we're transmitting is being blorched out all over the spectrum. The total radiated power might only be a few microwatts, but only a few nanowatts of that is actually being put into the intended LoRa transmission. This isn't something you could commercially use. This isn't even something that you should make more than one or two units of or test for more than a few minutes at a time. A microcontroller is like a small computer. It's got a computing core, RAM, permanent memory, and I.O. But in all of these areas, microcontrollers are very limited. This one only has about 64 kilobytes of flash and 20 kilobytes of RAM, and is typical of something like a USB keyboard, mouse, or other USB connected device. I love playing with these limited resources because it forces me to think much more creatively. Microcontrollers ride the line between hardware, being mostly defined by rules and laws, and software, where there are no rules. Where software and physics mix, some very interesting things can happen. With software running on a microcontroller, we can turn switches on and off very quickly and very precisely. Even though we can't turn them on or off any faster than a two, few tens of megahertz, by turning them on and off very carefully, we can create little tiny bits of noise way up the spectrum in places these chips have no business sending anything. And those little bits of energy can be created carefully and clearly enough to be received by LoRa receivers. The solutions I found to do this don't just work on one microcontroller because of some hardware quirk, but these solutions work on lots of other microcontrollers as well. Several weeks back, my friend Frank was chatting in my Discord server about various RF technologies when they explained some of the technical details of LoRa, a long-range, low-data rate RF protocol, and that it was able to traverse tens of kilometers with only a few milliwatts of power. It was time for me to take note. We chatted a bit, and the thought of sending LoRa packets without a radio, even just a few inches or maybe feet apart, seemed outlandish, but within the margin of possibility. And if there's one thing that captivates my interest, it's the things that only have a tiny chance of success. The path this project took was circuitous, and I'd really like to tell that story. So, join me in the story of the most surprising result from any of my projects I've ever had. Laura, although it's very low data rate, on the order of about 2 kilobits per second for most of our tests, is specifically designed to operate over long ranges at low power, which is pretty unique among most wireless protocols. There's only a few available transceivers on the market, and the protocol itself is still proprietary. There is a lot of information online about LoRa, and a lot of it's, well, wrong. And that's because it's all been derived by various people through reverse engineering. And with limited information, making a functional transmitter was difficult. One of the first difficulties that I identified was that the operational frequency that most inexpensive microcontrollers can control I.O. at is limited, typically from around 20 to 80 mega samples per second. Sometimes core clocks are higher, like the ESP32-S2's 240 MHz core clock, but there's no way to route that anywhere near the output pins. So the frequencies that we have to work with are all relatively low. But if you've ever been involved in making a product that must pass EMI and EMC tests, you begin to fear even these lower frequencies because they can cause interference at higher frequencies. 
That's because when transistors turn on and off, they don't just make a principal frequency unless they're making a perfect sine wave. When they make things that look more like square waves, they generate harmonics higher up the radio spectrum. You can hear this in the difference between a sine wave and a square wave. Let's lower the frequency much, much lower. Even though it's unlikely your speakers can produce this 27.5 hertz sine wave, you can hear a 27.5 hertz square wave. And that's because the square wave actually produces all of the odd harmonics. For instance, a square wave is made up of the fundamental frequency, as well as three times the frequency, five times the frequency, seven times the frequency, and so on. Each of these harmonics up the spectrum is much smaller, as a function of being a square wave. And when microcontrollers produce square waves, there are also natural physical limitations causing slew rate limitation on the GPIOs, further shrinking these overtones. While the power might be very, very small, these harmonics do exist. Armed with this knowledge and a dream, I wrote some code for the ESP32-S2. Since it has an audio PLL or phase lock loop, but it is extremely versatile, able to generate fractionalized multiples of the 40 megahertz onboard crystal. For instance, we could tune the numerator to 13.884, which multiplies the 40 megahertz on board to create a 555.36 megahertz numerator, which the PLL internally divides by four to generate an APLL clock of 138.84 megahertz. Sadly, the highest I've been able to get this to actually go out of the chip at is through another divide by two. So in this example, the final output signal is 69.420 megahertz. Because this is a square-ish wave, it generates odd harmonics, including the 13th harmonic at 902.46 megahertz. Because no signal is a perfect square wave and the odd harmonics power falls off with frequency, there's very little power up at 900 megahertz but it's there, which we can see by moving this SDR antenna right next to the wire pair on this swage from MagFest. The swage is a game system that uses an ESP32 S2 as the main processor, and it doesn't really use the built-in 2.4 GHz radio for very much. It also has an SAO port for hobbyists to use as they please. There's nothing special about any of the hardware on this swage, but we can route the 69.420 MHz signal and its inverse to the SAO port here. And we can also tune that just a little bit lower and a little bit higher. And that's all we need to transmit LoRa frames. The reason we need to move the frequency around a little bit is that LoRa uses chirps to actually send data. Instead of having a tone turn on and off, like with OOK or on off keying, AM, amplitude modulation, or PSK or phase shift keying, LoRa uses these chirps. These chirps create an up or down flowing tone, and depending on where they start, they can convey information. When I started on this project, I didn't know just how hard it was going to be to create these chirps, outputting exactly the right frequencies at exactly the right times, but I knew it was going to take an enormous amount of trial and error. In fact, my sandbox counts the number of recompiles and uploads to the SP, and it took 1900 tries before I got everything working robustly on the ESP32 S2. Thankfully, I was doing the development in my ESP32 S2 cookbook, IDF Sandbox, which lets me change code, recompile, upload, and run it in about one second, instead of the eight to 20 seconds that it takes for the IDF to reboot the ESP into program mode, build the firmware, reflash it, and test it. It only took about 15 hours for me to get the ESP32 S2 transmitting readable LoRa packets, whereas if I had been using the IDF, it would have taken half that amount of time just in the recompiling and flashing process. And with an attention span as short as mine, I probably never would have finished this project. My code simply reads the current time and processor cycles and determines what the PLL settings should be at that exact instant, and it writes them into the PLL registers. I can create any frequency at the 903.9 MHz, 125 kHz wide channel at any time by adjusting the APLL's output on the pin from 69.526 to 69.536 MHz, a spread of just 9.6 kHz. 
With this, I can create several upchirps as a preamble, two more upchirps to define the network type, 0x43 for LoRaWAN, two and a quarter down chirps as a payload. The length of each chirp depends on something called the spreading factor, where for SF7, for instance, each chirp takes 1,024 microseconds. For SF8, that goes a little bit slower, and each chirp takes 2,048 microseconds. Each one of these chirps can encode 7 or 8 bits of data. If you think this sounds complicated, boy howdy do I have some bad news for you. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Lori uses a very sophisticated combination of gray codes interleaving and error correction in order to maximize the recoverability of transmitted messages, even changing the number of bits encoded into each chirp depending on the spreading factor. And with it not being standard, all of this information had to be gleaned from various people's reverse engineering efforts. I was able to adopt some of the code from Myriad RF from one of those efforts, and with the help of Frank getting some real pack packets captured, after only about 500 attempts, I was able to get a packet that could be successfully received by this MicroTik WAP LR9 commercial gateway. This was fun and highly unusual, using a GPIO to send signals up at 900 megahertz that had absolutely no business being there. The signal was really ragged though, producing lots of spurious noise around the intended frequency, and the tracking on the, the actual intended signal was relatively poor. The APLL is an analog system after all. This overall was a bit of a dead end. Nothing I did was able to clean up the signal, and while it was technically working on the 13th harmonic, I had to give up and just accept my, well, I thought, a mediocre success. On top of that, it just wasn't that impressive because, after all, there was a Wi-Fi radio sitting in the ESP32S2, even though I wasn't using it, and I was curious if there were other ways and other directions that might yield more fruit. I moved on to the ESP8266 because it had a very potent glorified shift register in the form of an I2S bus that could be fed with DMA. This was used in a previous video to broadcast color, channel 3, and TSC video at 62.5 MHz. For ESP8266 development, I didn't need the Wi-Fi, and so I used my NoSDK8266 project. Really, there's two reasons behind this. One is that on many systems, I struggle to get the whole Python packages properly installed to be able to get the, and use the whole tool chain with its dependencies in the ESP tool. The other is that it would take several seconds to recompile and flash the ESP every time I wanted to test even a few lines of difference. I recently removed ESP tools usage from NoSDK8266 in favor of Dr. Wolf's ESP Util, a completely C, multi-platform ESP programming tool with zero dependencies and downloadable binaries, so that I completely remove the need to fool around with Python dependencies and because there's no massive SDK, I can develop quickly and do things with the ESP8266 that you ordinarily can't do. For one, normally the ESP8266 can only be run at an 80 MHz AHB, limiting the maximum that you can twiddle a pin at being 40 MHz. But with no SDK8266, we can overclock the AHB to around 216% of its original speed, shifting data out on an I.O. pin at 173 mega samples per second, able to generate a max frequency of around 86.5 MHz. It's a fixed 173 mega samples per second, so you can't play the same game as if we were on the ESP32 S2. We're locked into that 173. We talked about harmonics, but there's another trick that I have up my sleeve. This is one that I learned from that color television project that I previously mentioned. You can generate arbitrary signals through the magic of aliasing and images a signal can get reflected around half of the sampling frequency as well as three times, five times, seven times, and, well, all of the odd harmonics of that sampling frequency as well. When I was transmitting color video at 61.25 MHz, my actual signal was down at around 18.75 MHz, but being reflected around 40 MHz. What's weirder is that it's a reflection, so a tone at 39 MHz has an imposter at 41 MHz. A tone at 20 MHz, much lower, has an imposter at 60 MHz, much higher. The Wikipedia article on undersampling is a pretty good introduction to the kind of thinking that's needed when working in this domain. 
When we enter this regime of digital synthesis, things get weird. A single tone can be reflected and aliased around several ways before it lands where I want it to. And there's really weird restrictions. For instance, as you synthesize frequencies that are very close to the base of the sampling frequency, the amount of power that can actually be transmitted is very low. That's because there's very few bit transitions. To get power, you have to be able to turn the I.O. on and off a lot. And so you have to be very careful with what frequency that you select and which one you shift around. While it would be a good thing if you were to understand exactly what's going on here as the RF signal is shifted around and mixed, to understand why there are so many weird images all over the spectrum, it's not crucial. There is a shortcut, which I haven't really found people talking about anywhere. So if it doesn't already have a name, I'm going to call it the lore cut. You can just ignore all of the fancy math and write some code to imagine a signal that you want and the frequency that you want it at. And you just sample it where you would output a bit. Heck, you can even skip some bits if you know where they're going to be skipped. Maybe this is just undersampling. Oh, and to go from analog to digital, if the signal is greater than zero, output a one. If the signal is less than zero, output a zero. Or if you did want to change the amplitude, you can just shift it up or down. That's it. When you do this shortcut, it generally seems to produce pretty good results, causing the desired signal to be produced where you wanted it produced, though it does come with some other garbage up and down on the spectrum. And I haven't found any ways of producing more of the signal that you want where you want it when you're only able to output a subharmonic bitstream. Also, when pre-computing the signal, you can take as long as you want, creating it ahead of time, and then burn the pattern into the part's flash so that the microcontroller can produce what could be a very difficult to produce signal just by blasting through a lookup table. I can already hear some of you Nyquisters out there saying, but you can only receive or send signals at half the sampling rate. Having tasted and seen intentional aliasing, I hope all engineers can let go of the one-half FS safety blanket and develop the more nuanced view of sampling. The approach I took was to pre-compute a bitstream for an up chirp and a down chirp, given a target channel, bandwidth, spreading factor, and clock frequency. I flash this onto the ESP266 in a given place in flash that is then read into RAM at boot, since the flash stops working when we overclock the ESP anyway. That way I also could iterate very quickly on my code without needing to reflash the whole table. I originally got it working when overclocking the ESP to 173 MHz, and then after some tweaks I got it working down to the factory speed of 80 MHz. Each one of these transitions of the RX pin on the ESP causing just a small disturbance, but very carefully placed where I want it. I was able to get the clock rate all the way down to 7.2 mega samples per second before I couldn't get any 900 megahertz LoRa messages through. With the requirement of only 7.2 mega samples per second, this could be ported to all sorts of much cheaper microcontrollers, use less memory resources or other resources inside the processor. Even though the disturbances that this is now creating up at 900 megahertz are microscopic when the bitstream is only 7.2 mega samples per second, it's outputting less than 3.6 megahertz. LoRa receivers tuned to the 900 megahertz still get a minuscule signal and somehow can understand the messages. One of LoRa's tricks is that it can understand messages below, way below the noise floor. Once I had all of the code set to pre-compute the bitstreams to generate LoRa messages, I then ported the project to the CH32V203 I showed at the beginning of this video. It's a totally radio-less part. It has a DMA-controlled SPI bus that can shift out bits at one-half the system clock rate. So for a part operating at the factory speed of 144 MHz, we can shift out bits at 72 megabits per second. It still took several hundred cycles of programming to get the bitstream reasonable, and I had to iterate through several different programming patterns. After I ran into some difficulties with the internal crystal oscillator control circuitry and a PLL, I had to have one of my ESP32-S2 programmers generate a 24 MHz reference clock to work off of, clocking through various configurations. Eventually, though, I was able to get the signal working at 144 MHz using the normal crystal oscillator. In doing this port, I found a few minor issues with the code as it was stood on the ESP8266, and so I fixed that port by updating a common header file. 
I then ported the whole project to the CH32V003, the Tencent little brother to the 203, and after a lot of trouble getting it to produce a workable signal, I found a few bugs that were present in the 203 code base and even one or two in the core lore code. I eventually found out that the compiler replaced some of my carefully written code with a mem copy, which was not specifically tuned for the low-end RISC-V processors, and it had strange side effects, resulting in slightly mangled, but still kind of understandable bitstreams, because of the timing of each assembly instruction in its loop. I had to rewrite that code in assembly to get it to go as fast on the 003. After moving to this improvement back to the 203, it performed even better. I think memcopy was right on the edge of keeping up on the 203, but now using a custom copy, it's able to easily keep up. As a side note, I never could figure out how to get the SPI on the 203 to be perfect, and I'm really sad I couldn't get its I2S engine working, because that probably would have been perfect, if it even has an I2S engine. You can see a little bit of junk around our signal, whereas something like the ESPD266 really is perfect. I'd like to try doing a timer or DMA-fed timer approach someday, since that might be perfect and use less storage. Now that I had the ability to send LoRa messages, let's take this to the next level with LoRa WAN packets. If one of these bad boys gets received by a LoRa gateway connected to the Things network or the Helium network, it can be relayed through the internet and around the world. So a microcontroller printf on somebody's desk in another country can be sent to an app running in the server in my parents' basement. Thankfully, there's a clean separation for where the underlying LoRa protocol is mostly encapsulated away from the higher level LoRa WAN packets. To receive these packets from the Things network by my Microtik LR9, I had to set up a new app on the Things network. From there, I created a new device using the base LoRaWAN 1.00 spec and selected Activization by Personalization. This makes it possible to share the secret encryption keys with my device without it ever needing to receive any packets at all. Setting the device ID, network S key, app S key, and programming them into a commercial device, Frank was able to generate some valid LoRaWAN packets, and I was able to snag them on air and decode the raw encrypted data with LoRa GRC running GNU Radio. I just had to figure out how to make my packets encrypt using the correct AES keys and compute the right AES CMAC so that my code would have the same output as the commercial code, which worked. This took a lot of trial and error, rereading the LoRaWAN spec, at least the LoRaWAN spec is documented, trying to navigate one indexed and zero index arrays as the example code, writing my own CMAC code eventually from the ground up, which is now licensed under the unlicensed if anyone wants it. When transmitting the same payload as Frank, I was finally able to get the same output. After hooking it up, I found out I needed to check one of the boxes that allows frame counter resets on the Things network. Packets were flowing. I created the LoRaWAN generation into a single function call and ported it to the CH32V203, and now the project was complete. In downtown Bellevue, my girlfriend took a CH32V203 with a short wire plugged into the MOSI pin and connected it to a USB power bank. We started at just a few feet, since that's all I ever expected. But we kept having to readjust, and the test would go further and further. Eventually, we got to the farthest place where we could still get line of sight, and were able to find some orientations where packets would still flow just fine. We were transmitting valid LoRaWAN packet frames 440 feet, or 134 meters. We redid the test at both 125 and 500 kilohertz channel widths. When going to 500 kilohertz to maintain the same airtime, I increased the SF number by two. This has the effect of sending the same amount of data through, but with a signal spread that's wider and lower. When operating at 500 megahertz channels, the receiver was getting signals down at negative 18 decibels signal to noise ratio. 18 dB SNR means that for every one part signal, there's almost 100 parts noise. So on these waterfall plots, you can't really see the transmitted signal at all. Decibels or dB are a logarithmic scale. So for every three dB change, that corresponds to half or doubling of the power. Every 10 dB to a 10 times increase or decrease. Every 6 dB up corresponds to a doubling of range and every 6 dB down, a halving. And when dealing with absolute power like dBm, 0 dBm corresponds to 1 milliwatt of power, negative 10, 100 microwatts, 
negative 30 corresponds to one microwatt of power. When we look at this SDR waterfall view and we see this extra junk hanging around our graph, it's important that we notice that this image at the right is actually one tenth of the power of the peak right here. Don't let the vlog scale fool you and scare you. The little wire that we plugged into the MOSI pin could have been a trace on a PCB going to a touch button, LED switch, or going somewhere else inside of an actual product. People call these misused connections inside of a product that are being misused as an antenna a fun tenna. While having a wire connected to nothing is as optimal as you can get, short of having a proper antenna, it's by no means unrealistic in principle, as we'll see later. For the sake of the main thesis of this video, using a regular dev board, an analog for a consumer product like a camera, audio digitizer, or, or the like, without any hardware mods, just different firmware, we could send messages to a commercial off-the-shelf gateway in a crowded downtown area and have these same messages forwarded to the internet. And it worked at 435 feet or 132 meters away. I would consider this a madcap success. It completely blew my mind. And I asked my dad about this problem when sketching it out. His original expectation is that we would be able to transmit no more than 20 feet. And even that I was dubious of. But why stop here? What if we go somewhere with a longer line of sight, somewhere without tens of thousands of electronic devices blaring in my block? Frank and I went to a park in a more suburban area to do a test, this time with a receiver and an external antenna. We completely exhausted the length of the park before we had to go into the woods and we lost track after 550 feet. We then went to a paragliding strip, figuring that there'd be no way we'd max out the 1,100 feet. But nope, the packet still got through, loud and clear. We then found a straight road before we got a fair max distance reading of 2,200 feet or 669 meters and negative 133 decibels receive power. This is more a testament of lore and not just this project that my tiny little transmitter transmitting probably 50 nanowatts could make messages that could be received and decoded over a third of a mile away. There was some foliage between the transmitter and the receiver, and we wanted to push this and give this part the best opportunity it could get. Frank took his drone, and my girlfriend and I went out to a huge park to do a real, clear, line-of-sight range test. We strapped the little radioless CH32V203 to his quadcopter and sent it on its way, first with a 125 killer channel, then a 500 killer channel. The little CH32V203 was able to go... 20 to 20 feet or 677 meters at the 125 kilohertz channel width or only about 1752 feet or 534 meters at the 500 kilohertz channel width. Then for kicks we decided to do a little hardware mod and overvolt the CH32V203 to 5 volts instead of the 3.3 volts that it's rated for and we're able to get it to talk 3996 feet or 12 118 meters over a kilometer. Admittedly, this is cheating, but it's still incredible that we were able to get packets to flow over a whole kilometer without any external passives or active components. After some discussion, we made a new, slightly shorter antenna based on some VNA tests and switched back to the 3.3 volts and sent the 203 off to finally get our real definitive number. Our little CH32V203 with factory settings, was able to reach 2719 feet or 829 meters with only a little wire hanging off of its MOSI pin. We had our final answer. We were able to transmit valid LoRa packets over half a mile. While we were still at the park, we also tested the 8266 and found out that it was able to send LoRa messages 2789 feet or around 850 meters. We packed up to head home, but then Frank noticed the swag that I had in my bag and asked about it. I thought about how I started the project with the ESP32S2 initially, but the signal was really rough and we really weren't able to do more than a few feet with it. But that was before I uncovered all of the bugs discovered with the other processors. So we just decided to do a real quick test by walking on the ground. I'm at a thousand feet. Well, still coming through. I had to go to work, but we returned later that day, where it was a little bit more rainy and a little bit more snowy and filled with a lot more elk. 
We programmed the ESP32-S2 and the SWAG to make 125 kHz wide SF10 coded packets, strapped it to his quadcopter, put on a bitenna, and sent it on its way. Frank got out to 1429 meters, or 4895 feet, before he had to fly back. But all of our packets were still coming through, like almost a kilometer and a half away. Just to do a test with a fun tenna, we decided to remove all the wires from the swag and used it as it comes, without any hardware mods at all, and got to 705 feet, or 215 meters. Running out of daylight quickly, we estimated the max theoretical range based on the current receive power in SNR and found a very straight trail nearby. Frank drove to one part and set up his drone with the swag on it, and I drove to the other part and parked and started walking to where the trail would get straight. It's so hard to express how utterly deranged this seems. I was soaking wet, it was freezing, I couldn't feel my fingers, and was walking to a dot on a map 2.5 kilometers, or 1.6 miles, from where Frank set up his drone. And I hoped that by waving this LoRa receiver around in the air, I was going to capture a LoRa packet. And, after a short message from our sponsor, uh, just kidding, that's exactly what happened. The ESP32-S2's audio PLL, the marginal failure from earlier on in the project, which I thought was too dirty to do anything useful with, was a complete sleeper success. That little audio PLL built in turned out to be the GOAT. 16 decibels below the noise floor, we caught a packet at negative 141 dBm, or less than 1 100th of a femtowatt. I have a whole new level of respect for the engineers who were involved in the creation of LoRa and the designers of its receivers. And Espressif, if you see this, please bring back the audio PLL for newer chips. It's so powerful and it can be used in so many novel ways. Anyway, it was over. It was finally over. Not only did an ESP32-S2 send a packet at 900 MHz, a frequency that its radio can't operate at, it transmitted a packet farther than any ESP32-S2 has ever sent a packet without the aid of some kind of directional antenna or signal booster. This insane rabbit hole came to an end, and on the other side was something even more outlandish and unhinged than Wonderland. There's a lot of fun things I learned on this project and some interesting tools that I found that I wanted to mention. One of those tools was the AirSpy and AirSpy Mini. Previously I used RTL SDR dongles to great success, but the AirSpies are massively better in both SNR and dynamic range and bandwidth. It was so helpful to see 10 MHz of a spectrum all at once instead of being limited to 3.2 MHz that the RTL SDR was limited to. Another really great tool is GQRX. It's similar to SDR Sharp, but for Linux, and it feels a little bit simpler to use. It really helps for getting the lay of the land or a smoke test to see if I'm transmitting somewhere where I think I am. It helps me kind of like scrub around and find the signal. It also helps me to get a feeling for how powerful the signals that are being transmitted are and where they actually lie. In conjunction with the AirSpy Mini and GQRX, you can now clearly see a large chunk of the spectrum to help get a more intuitive understanding about what's really going on in reality. For instance, being able to look at this signal here and how moving the antenna around just a few millimeters can so drastically change the receive pattern, causing even slight differences in frequencies to go in and out of destructive and constructive interference modes. That actually shows a major point that for signals like LoRa and even Wi-Fi, for more info on that you can see my video on high-res Wi-Fi signal mapping, for reliable signals, diversity and related technologies are crucial. Diversity means receiving or transmitting signals from two separate antennas, separated, that way there's going to be very few, if any, dead zones. For narrowband signals like LoRa, even a few millimeters in position or orientation can be humongous changes in the effective range, where the signal can go from very strong to almost invisible. By having multiple antennas, you can apply a Swiss cheese model. While there are holes when using one antenna and holes when using another antenna, or two antennas on each side, so you have four combinations, the chances of you being somewhere or in an orientation where all of the combinations fail quickly approaches zero. Another helpful tool was GNU Radio. 
This app is designed to do more advanced operations with SDRs, and there are multiple LoRa decoders available for it, though all of them are just a little bit buggy, so I can't really recommend any. They were helpful to sanity check my work nonetheless. One thing I did with it was that I took the input data stream, ran a small FFT, and logged the output to an FFT file. Then I could go and use STB image write to output a PNG file. I've included this tool in the tools folder of my project's repo, Lorasoft, a sort of very high resolution waterfall view. This came in really handy when we tried cloning my garage door opener with an ESP8266. I looked at the back of the opener, googled the FCC ID, it said that it was at 310 megahertz, checked on GQRX, and sure enough there was a signal right there at 310 megahertz. I ran the high resolution waterfall on it, and I could see that the signal was using a sort of OOK modulation. So I cloned the pattern of on and off pulses, and made my bit table generator output 310 megahertz. Shockingly, I actually got about the same range with my ESP8266 transmitting 310 megahertz on a GPIO as I did from the real opener. Oh, there's another interesting wrinkle with the bit table generator. It matters that one selects a good period for it. For instance, if you pick an arbitrary number of bits for your table size, we might not line up when the one wave goes around the end of the table and wraps back onto the beginning. So it's important to make sure that your output, the output of your bits has as small of an error as possible when going off one end of the table and back onto the beginning. Discontinuities will cause significant sideband noise messing with the signal. One thing to note here is that if you do make it line up, you'll get a very powerful and narrow band signal. Great if that's what you want, but many times that may not be what you want. Let's look at something like the CH32V003. It has both an internal RC oscillator, or it can use an external crystal. Even when using a crystal, it's really rough to use with this project because the clock wanders around some. On average, the 003 runs at 48 MHz. But over the course of several microseconds, the clock rate can actually vary pretty a lot. And when you compare it to the internal RC oscillator, the clock moves around so much that it spreads any noise that's generated just all over the spectrum. For most engineers, this is a huge benefit. If you're hoping to create a product that can pass FCC testing, this feature is a godsend. It just makes it so that if you're trying to abusively modulate signals out your SPI port, you're going to have a bad time. Congratulations, you made it to the end of the video. I hope I've been able to inspire you to do something new and fun that goes beyond the datasheet. Don't just paint by numbers using the existing Arduino libraries. Explore just how wide the canvas goes. While my code isn't perfect, I'm sure there's bugs, and it doesn't work with spreading factors other than 7 to 10, all of my code as well as a detailed write-up is available on GitHub. Link is in the description. I wanted to say thanks to Matt Knight for their reverse engineering work, Myriad RF and Arnie Henning for their work on writing code to work with the LoRa protocol, GR LoRa SDR developers, Frank for his inspiration and depth of knowledge about RF stuff, Wilmore for the editing work, several other people from my Discord for their help, and you. Thanks for watching.